it doesn't matter if it's B to B, if it's B to C, if it's B to H, if it's B to dog. Learn from the people who do it best, right? Welcome to the Frontify podcast, where we interview brand leaders from around the world. And today we are honored to be joined by Russell Benson, Senior Marketing Director at Gong. Yeah, Russell, really excited about having you today. Uh, thanks for making the time. Um, you know, like Brian and I, and, and you know, also like internally, we, we really love what Gong is doing. I mean, as a product, but also really, you know, your communication, everything you do on social media. Um, I think you mentioned recently, like, you know, people are just always, you know, taking screenshots on, on new posts and, and sending them around also like internally here uh, in, in different WhatsApp groups and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so um, we, we want to take the time today to explore a little bit on on what Gong is doing, what's what's making your communication special. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, you're the right person uh, to talk to today. So thanks. Thanks a lot for joining. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm flattered by the way, MJ. Like I feel like a test like a testament of really fantastic marketing is when people want to share it just for appreciation. It's like, hey, look at this thing. Uh so yeah, I really appreciate that and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Cool. Nice. Uh yeah, we actually always start with a with a super tricky but also like deep question and that's not very easy and very individual to to answer, but what is what is branding for you and what is branding for you at Gong? Yeah, for sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that I think about branding is branding is just a summary of all the touch points that a person has with your brand. I think where a lot of folks make the mistake is they're like, branding is branding is the logo. Branding is the color palette. It is the values that we have. Really, it's all those things, honestly. And then I would extend that even to Branding is the in, the interactions that people have with your sales team, with your customer experience team. It's the interactions that they have with viewing your messages on social media or watching the video on your website or on YouTube. Branding is all of those things. It's the summary of all the touch points that a person has with a brand. And that's how we think about it uh, at Gong as well. Mm. And I think that's exactly also the the story that we we tell. So uh, I think it's it's becoming more and more complex having all those different touch points uh, that you know like really everyone needs to be involved in brand to be able uh, to to really shape the, the trust uh, and build the trust in a company. Um, where, where do you see the the difference between branding and marketing then? Yeah, for sure. So when I think about the differences between branding and marketing, marketing is kind of like marketing is the how those touch points are created. Uh, marketing are the events, they're the content, they're the uh, they're the direct mail campaigns, they're all of those things. Marketing is is the how that those touch points happen to create kind of the brand experience. Yeah, really nice. And uh, again, I think you know uh, what what we also hear quite a lot is kind of you know the what you say you are versus kind of you know what people. Uh, feel and think and, and, and who you are. And, and I think that that's a really nice segue to kind of how we started this podcast and, you know, our impression who Gong is. And and uh, ideally, in an ideal scenario, that's exactly how, what you intended, you know, the audience to, to think and feel about uh, about Gong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally resonates. And, and when I think about, uh, when I say like the summary of all the touch points that a person has with a brand, it's definitely like, what is the feeling that they're getting when they think about Gong, when they think about Frontify, like what are, like, what are those feelings that, uh, that come out from the summary of those touch points? So yeah, totally resonates with me too. I, I think for us as, as part of the, the kind of sales cycle, we've been you guys now for about a year and a half. I think even subconsciously the, those short, sharp posts, I mean, we were straight away into your feed and we of course were very focused on the, the park, the evaluation and, and what the tool added. But I, I think there was just that fun side that we're constantly seeing the, these fun things. And that's, I would probably say, as we touched on the, the kind of WhatsApp and the sharing, um, because we, we did the evaluation with one of our senior AEs and that's how kind of the WhatsApp group started. And yeah, it was kind of really fun al alongside of the, the serious negotiation of, of, of buying a product. So. Yeah, Brian, I, I, I love to hear that because it's totally intentional. <laughs> one is one is that the uh, one is that the one of our top operating principles of business is to create raving fans. Create raving fans is something that we do uh, in all of our marketing, and of course, in, in the experiences that we want to give all of our customers. Uh, 
but we want it. Yeah, we want that tone, that same that same tone, that same feeling to come across again, and and even experiences like the sales process. So yeah, really, really, really happy to hear mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and I think it's really like this, uh, the, the sharpness, the, the, the shortness of the posts and also, also like really the, the authenticity and the uniqueness and the, the human touch points that you're really kind of uh, creating. And, and I always like tell people the example of, uh, you know, your CMO playing the piano on the weekend. And, and I think that's just something you haven't seen before uh, in B2B marketing or at least not often. And uh, yeah, so so how much of this is orchestrated? How much of this is kind of, you know, the marketing team uh, really, you know, asking people to do that or really like people understanding the brand by themselves uh, kind of, you know, doing their own thing. And, and yeah, how do we how do you tackle that, basically? Yeah, it, it's it's truly a little bit of both. And sometimes when when you start kind of like rallying your entire company around a brand, a tone, a, a, a way to to give an experience, you have to kind of nudge it like a snowball going down a hill to start the avalanche. Mm. And we do things pretty intentionally to orchestrate it. Like, for example, when we want everyone to rally across the entire company around sharing a particular thing, whether that's a new funding announcement, maybe it's a new executive joining our team, anything like that, we actually send a company-wide invite with like preceded social text that people can use, the assets associated to that announcement. And we're like, hey, take this time, we're blocking it on your calendar, and go and share this thing. Now, that's kind of like the orchestrated side of things. But then along the way, people see the power that social and brand has on our business. It has a truly transformational business impact, and it gets so many people to know who Gong is, get, to, uh, get us to engage with a lot of different people. And so they kind of just like start to get it, right? And they start mm -hmm. to want to do things on their own. They see people like Udi, who you described our CMO, uh, have a ton of engagements on their <laughs> posts. And they're like, hey, as a maybe as a salesperson or maybe as a CSM, like, I see the impact that that can have on my career, on the business, so on and so forth. And so that's when you really like start to pick up steam and it kind of just starts, continues to snowball. Mm. I'd love to know, I always feel I'd sometimes describe your, your posts as kind of micro posts. And I think that's what adds the, the fun side. What was the real strategy behind that? Do you, do, you, do you kind of guideline it to, to kind of really keep it short, sharp and punchy? Or is that just, it's just part of your strategy? I think. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Go ahead I, know, I think my, my best example mm -hmm. and the one that I always return back to was um, I was based from your data and uh, it said something along the lines of, no, this email is not finding me well. And then you, you went into the, <laughs> the details of, of how, why not to use that, that classic line that we, that we know too many AEs use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So uh, in terms of like how it's orchestrated, we have like key pillars that we all know that we are. We're human. We challenge conventional wisdom and we're not afraid to be a little bit different and to candidly we're not afraid to piss anybody off uh, <laughs> i'm sure people really love i hope this email found you well like they've been doing it for 25 years and so uh i'm pretty sure people love it but we're not afraid to challenge those things so we challenge conventional wisdom we're human uh we're we're always creative and we we're, we're very very succinct as well we know that like we want to deliver like one message at a time generally uh we want it to be impactful and so that's where you get that kind of like short and punchy tone um but it took us a long time to get there honestly mm -hmm. uh a lot of like we've built now a framework for both uh both our kind of like company page as well as like individual pages but it took us a really really long time to figure out what worked what didn't work we tracked themes we tracked length we tracked uh social uh like post type whether we use video or image or all caps in the first line so on and so forth we've tested all these things over time so it didn't come just you know it didn't just come uh it came with with some pretty intentional uh effort along the way it, it really sounds like you cracked kind of the magic formula there because you mentioned so many puzzle pieces right now i think that really have to go hand in hand uh, for it to to be successful and you know even just like uh the clear call to action to the entire you know uh, company to really do it and to block time in the calendar sounds like a, something so simple but i think it's you know 
the moment you leave, you know, maybe, you know, Slack or uh, whatever it is, uh, that the meeting where this is announced, you're, you're back into operational business. And, you know, that's the moment, like, where you maybe already forget about, like, the call to action from, from marketing to do so. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm super interested in your personal involvement there. Like, how, how have you been involved in, in the growth of, you know, LinkedIn at, at Gong? Like, what was your role? And, and yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been very fortunate. I, I joined Gong. Maybe I'll give a little bit of history on myself and, and when I joined the company and that kind of stuff to paint the picture a little bit. But I've been very fortunate to have joined Gong around when we had, I don't know, around 100 employees or so. Uh, at that same time on our social profiles, we had maybe a couple of thousand followers at the time. And I've been really, really lucky to be a part of some really fun projects along the way that have helped accelerate uh, our growth on social. And that's things like one April Fool's Day, we announced that we're launching the Gong dating app. And we said, we're pivoting the entire business. We no longer do revenue intelligence. You can now figure out what words to say during your date that'll get you to the next step. Right? <laughs> I love like, it. We, we had some fun campaigns like that. We've had one super fun one when we did our Series C. We filmed this video called Sales in the City, which is a play on Sex in the City. <laughs> and uh, it went it did really, really well on social. We had a Super Bowl commercial back in February, uh, but that's helped accelerate our growth to now 85,000 or so followers. Uh, and my role within the company is uh, revenue marketing, but including the content team. Uh, so content, including social and video and webinars and so on and so forth. Nice. I know you mentioned, um, we were talking before, you know, you're kind of a, a lot of passion for your hip hop, a lot of passion for the, the basketball and uh, American football. And I think you just mentioned then with regards to the, the kind of Super Bowl ad. I'd love to hear more about that and maybe how, um, how you, after the Super Bowl ad, did you it, it thread that in as well with the social media post to, to build up? Because that was very, very disruptive. <laughs> so, Thanks. Um, I'm so glad to hear that, Brian. Yeah, we, we were very uh, specific in that we want to do the Super Bowl, which of course, there's a lot of folks in our core persona that love American football. Uh, <laughs> we primarily go after VPs of sales and the chief revenue officer. And so a lot of those folks typically love football. And so we were we were like, we've got to do the Super Bowl. It's also challenging conventional wisdom and is very different for a B2B brand. Uh, but we said going into it, we said, okay, we, we know that like the Super Bowl commercial itself will probably yield a good amount. But if we're gonna do as a as a kind of small company compared to the other folks that typically do Super Bowl commercials, we gotta squeeze every dang thing out of this, you know, <laughs> out of this lemon that we possibly can. So we prepared the entire company, we showed the entire company maybe three days in advance the Super Bowl commercial and we said like everybody like we've got to make this such a big kind of like market moving moment and so we rallied we got everybody excited we printed some t-shirts that we gave away on on social media uh, we made sure that all of our paid acquisition was ready to go to continue to amplify that video to our target audience and so yeah we we were really really <laughs> intentional about coordinating both efforts on social as well as the actual ad itself because gosh dang what a what a bet right and, uh, <laughs> i i still remember submitting it you know submitting the budget request to the board and and of course they're like wait doesn't doesn't Dor Doritos? I'm pretty sure it's like Doritos, Coca Cola, Pepsi. Those are the people that are doing Super Bowl commercials. You don't typically hear of a B two B revenue intelligence platform doing a Super Bowl commercial. So it felt really weird to a lot of people. Uh, so we, we we were sure about making the most mm -hmm. of it. Honestly, it sounds really massive. It sounds like a, a lot of preparation. It sounds like a lot of sleepless sleepless nights uh, even. So uh, yeah, I, I guess you really pulled it off. Uh, congrats on that. Thanks um, so much. I, I wanted to put, uh, touch base, sorry, on, on something that you mentioned earlier, basically, like, you know, the, the constant reiteration, the testing, understanding your audience. Uh, you mentioned already a few pieces, basically, uh, formats, length, all these kind of things. So how, how do you approach that? Like, how do you make sure? I mean, there is a branding aspect in it and, and you want to understand, like, how people perceive you. But then, of course, also like the very direct performance. So, um, yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, we... One, I, I have to give a huge shout out to our social and our marketing operations team. They are the people 
who make this like rapid testing and very intentional testing happen. Uh, and so want to give a big shout out to them mm -hmm. first, but it, it's just about trying different things every single week and making sure that you actually close the loop with a broader set of people to share that information. And the broader set of people can feed in different testing ideas in order to help you stay fresh on what those ideas are. So for example, we take a lot of learnings that we have on email marketing into the social sphere. Our emails kind of look a little bit the same and sound a little bit the same. So why not allow those things to feed one another? Mm -hmm. Because humans are on the other side of emails and humans are on the other side of social and generally it's the same persona. And so we can feed that a lot to one another. And then if we have that continuous feedback loop, then we just continue to iterate and, and learn and make sure we don't do the same thing, you know, more than two times, uh, you know, if we know that it doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think where people struggle with this idea, again, it's like such a simple thing, right? It's like have a continuous feedback loop, have a meeting on Fridays when you actually go and review the data. Uh, but where people struggle, I think is like, oh yeah, let's like test all these different things. and they kind of lose sight towards the end of that test in, in terms of closing that feedback loop. It's just like a test and then a test and then a test and then a test. Uh, but people don't close the loop and say like, let's actually learn and deploy those learnings uh, moving forward. Hmm. And, and like you mentioned something, you know, there, um, which is basically also in regards to that, that, that split, like, you know, testing also on, on messaging, of course, but also like testing, I guess, with financial means to see if you can get to another audience or, you know, you can even reach people that, that are currently not aware of, of Gong. Because, I mean, for us, it's really nice. Uh, we, we follow the post, but we have already bought the, the product, right? Uh, so the big question is actually, how do you how do you break that bubble and how much does, does paid also play a role uh, in, in that strategy? Yeah. Two comments. One is actually not related to the direct question, but one that I want to make sure that is resonates well with the audience is that you can use social as a new business acquisition channel, which is kind of like what you're describing is mm. like you started following the social posts, you had an awesome experience in the sales cycle and you love the product, but now I'm a customer. So now what? Uh, we are a software business. We have to win your business back every single day, MJ. So making sure that you don't lose sight of that, I think is important. Now to the, to the original question, which is like, how does like paid help amplify your organic? Uh, if you have aggressive growth goals, like, like Gong does, and you know, you have a persona that lives on a particular platform like LinkedIn, we talk about, you know, VPs of sales, we talk about uh, CROs being our target kind of persona. Mm. They, absolutely love LinkedIn. I got to say, salespeople are all over LinkedIn. Uh, and so doubling and tripling down both on the organic and the paid is super, super important in, in order for us to succeed. And so we make sure that those things play together. One is like we have the organic channels. We do a ton of different viral things to help that channel grow, whether that be giveaways or driving towards specific engagement, like, hey, make sure you comment on this post to do to get X, Y, and Z, like those kinds of things. And we're very intentional about testing as we talked about. But paid can help you break into all the people that, you know, there there are, yes, 85,000 people that follow Gong today, mm -hmm. but there's like, a, there's a, how many millions of salespeople in the world that we still got to reach? And so paid is a great way to make sure that we're doing that. The fun thing, though, is that those things can feed one another. And what I think some people may make the mistake of is they treat paid as like a direct response channel and a direct response channel exactly. only. Mm. And what they do is they say, OK, if we're doing paid, I'm going to measure that on a cost per lead basis. Mm. If they're really sophisticated, we're going to measure that on a pipeline or a revenue basis. And they orient around only doing things that will lead directly to pipeline and revenue, or maybe it's leads. But if you think about paid as just a, an additional way to reach people that aren't following you today, why not allow those things to play together? And so when we do things like major content releases on organic channels, what we'll actually do is take paid and say, hey, this thing may not be direct response. We might not even be able to track the dang results at the end of the day, aside from engagement, but we're going to sponsor our organic posts to make the engagement go really, really high. 
And what we've found is if you do that really early on, especially in the first couple hours of that, that organic post, it'll get it in more people in, in front of more people that follow you today, because you typically only get a sliver of your followers that get to actually see the post. And we get to expose it to more people on our ICP because the targeting on LinkedIn is, is pretty dang good. Mm. So yeah, those things need to play together uh, in order to win. And you shouldn't always kind of say, hey, I'm only going to measure this thing on on direct response kind of like numbers. Uh, if you do, you'll you'll be missing a huge opportunity to be successful. Mm. And, and, you know, I think there are different tactics there as well that I've seen, you know, for example, just going for organic posts and the ones that really perform well are boosted or to boost them all with uh, just like a small amount of money and the ones that really outperform to boost them even more. So what is Gong's strategy there? If, if, you, if you can uh, talk a little bit openly about that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so basically what we do is we pick like a certain content drops that we want to go pretty big on. And for us, that might be something like our Gong Lab series. Gong Labs is our series where it's data-backed articles. We work with our engineering or our data analytics team in order to pull interesting insights from the sales process. Like we've done so many, gosh. Uh, <laughs> how does team selling impact your deals? We did one on uh, how does swearing impact your sales cycle? <laughs> I love that one. I love it, by the way. <laughs> but when we, when we have pieces of content like that, where we do, I mean, we invest, I mean, candidly, thousands of dollars on making that piece of content awesome, whether that be through actual promotion, but it's also like the human hours that go into creating an asset like that. We know that we got to make sure we make the most of it, similar to what we talked about with the Super Bowl commercial. And so we will go really hard and, and go uh, with a paid boost on, on something like that. And then what we do is we track it over time and we see, okay, we're going to launch this thing. It's going to be for the first couple of days that we boost it intentionally mm -hmm. because we know we can get a really nice organic lift if we drive a lot of engagement up front. And then we track that thing over time and say, okay, when does the engagement start to taper off? But some we keep going for, I mean, maybe a month, sometimes three weeks, sometimes two weeks, but the shelf life can generally be, you know, decently long. It's not just mm. what happens a lot of times with social media. It's like, okay, you post it. Sometimes there's a 30 minute time span. Sometimes it's really fantastic and there's a 24 hour time span, but these things can live for, you know, for weeks, especially as you expose it to, to a wider and wider audience. And so uh we're, we're not afraid of keeping you know keep keeping boosting you know two posts from two weeks ago uh we'll, we'll keep doing that until kind of engagement starts to, to taper off interesting question from from kind of your existing customers and the retention aspect and new customers do you notice any difference on engagements i think from from myself i, I love your kind of your data posts they always interest me they're the ones that i go into so being an existing customer is that is that an analysis you've done or noticed any trends there yeah, we, we've definitely noticed that once folks become customers, they've gone through that raving fan experience generally. And we talked about branding up front at the beginning of the podcast and said, branding is a summary of all the touch points that a person has with your brand. And as you go through the customer journey, and it's a lot of times everything from experiencing our social media to our website to your experience with a salesperson or a customer success manager, you end up becoming a little bit more of a raving fan along the way. <laughs> and so uh, your aptitude to engage with our social media uh, can, can a lot of times increase. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, uh, and, and that happens, uh, I would say, as a blanket statement. But there's also people who uh, who follow us and engage a ton that aren't customers just yet. They just are a big fan of either the content, the data, or something else. And for those people, they're no longer just kind of like prospects. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just now customers and future customers within that bucket. Well, gongsters, as you call it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I love that you brought that uh, also like customer loyalty aspect to it, because I think it's even there is where you can really see the strength of a brand again, right? Because the, the, the date of renewal will come. And I think like the more champions you have in a company that really love your brand, uh, the easier it will be to, to have these negotiations, right? If everyone is on board, the entire buyer committee, all the levels, I, I think, and, and I'm convinced that there is like a really, really strong impact of brand that is maybe not even that measurable for that type of uh, i would say conversion but but definitely an important one mm. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. And there's a metric that businesses like ours and SaaS mm -hmm. look at often, which is net dollar retention. A dollar that you buy within this year, how does that grow into the next year? And gosh, I can't track it. And I can't exactly tell you what the impact of brand and social is on that net dollar retention number, which is so critical for calculating multiples and enterprise value. But I can sure as hell bet that there is a really, really exactly. strong correlation mm. there. Uh, and we're very, very fortunate at Gong to have people like Amit Bendov, who's our, our CEO and co-founder, who believe in that, right? They're willing to invest. Uh, we're lucky that Amit is a former CMO himself, so he does get it uh, quite a <laughs> bit. But uh, we're very fortunate in that because a lot of times it's murky, right? People have a hard time with this because mm. their CFO is like, hey, like, what is the, you know, mm. how, are, how are you calculating and measuring the impact of brand? Uh, which is a phenomenal question. There's a number of measures yeah. and metrics that you can look at. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, you know, unless there there is a leap of faith that you have to take to some degree, right? And uh, Gong has taken that leap of faith for sure. Cool. You mentioned, or oh, we, we, we went through so many topics right now, right? We, we had basically... Uh, the entire setup, brand, uh, the posts themselves, the analytics, uh, kind of, you know, engaging the entire company. I mean, uh, I think there are people in, in the audience right now thinking, okay, how big is this team? Like, who is pushing that stuff out? <laughs> like, uh, do they even sleep? So maybe you can give us a little bit of insight. Like, you know, how big is the social media team at Gong? Like, who, what's brand's involvement? What does marketing do? What do the people do? And, and maybe also, like, is there tech that you're leveraging? Um, yeah, I, I mean, people might not want to copy what Gong is doing, but maybe like, you know, get a little bit of inspiration. So yeah, whatever you can share there will be appreciated. Yeah, for sure. Here, here's a crazy fact, MJ and Brian. There is no person, no one person dedicated to social media at Gong. Oh, wow. Like we don't have a social media manager. Mm. We don't. We have a bunch of people who contribute to the power that I think is social but there isn't actually one person. Mm. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, there, we actually lack intentional focus to some degree because there's not one person who's like life kind of depends on social, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's made it for like our, our team to have a win as a team attitude towards our social media success. So it's actually been kind of a blissful oversight, I would say. <laughs> the people that, uh, that contribute to social today. There's one person on the team who does kind of like webinars and digital events in addition to, to social media and like kind of like owning what the actual content is on mm. social. There's somebody on our marketing operations team that owns email marketing and the actual kind of uh, operations behind social. What time do we post? How do we make sure that all the posts are set up correctly with the right UTMs and things like that. Uh, that's somebody on the operations team. Of course, there's there's Devin Reed, who's our head of content strategy, who's kind of like overseeing the, the general program. But you'll get ideas from myself. You'll get ideas from Udi. And then there is a slew of contractors across kind of like brand uh, that that assist as well to make sure that kind of the videos look on point, the, the design looks on point, uh, and the writing is all fantastic. We have copywriters, of course, that, that help as well. And now, like, not every company is in the same, you know, space, B2B SaaS, and like not every company has kind of, you know, or is in the luxurious uh, position to have so many people also like in the marketing team, even though it's not like one dedicated person. But what kind of advice would you have like for companies in different stages um, if they if they want to kind of level up their branding game on on social as well because i think it's it's a couple of things that we that we already slightly touch base on on you know um maybe even like a very traditional uh i would say rather old school um b2b company can really go down that route and, and you mentioned that it's human to human and you know the influence of brand and maybe they they need to also bring that in because it's it's a kind of a changing audience as well who really believes in the you know kind of that the brand needs to be authentic that the brand needs to deliver on their on, on their promises and you know they cannot fake brands cannot fake their their uh, kind of appearance anymore and, and you know mm -hmm. just say one thing but do the other so yeah i don't know it, it was a long question but the, the <laughs> short version would be basically <laughs> what do you kind of advise companies at different stages to to level up their their branding game on on, on social 
Yeah, I, I would say take inspiration from from others. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's so interesting. You have so many, and it, it's so pervasive in in B two B in particular. But it doesn't matter if it's B two B, if it's B two C, if it's B to H, if it's B to dog. Like just <laughs> learn from learn from the people who do it best, right? Like we actually don't at Gong. We don't take our inspiration like in our slack channels you don't see like this inspiring thing that uh you know x b2b company posted and this expiring thing that no shame on them that ibm posted for example mm -hmm. like we, we don't have, have those examples right we have examples of look at wendy's response to this post on social media they tagged mcdonald's and directly called them out in this crazy mm -hmm. way right that is where we take inspiration from and there's so much goodness happening already on social in order to level up their game uh, you know in order for businesses to level up their game they can just open their eyes and make sure that they keep that lens wide and not just narrow focused on people who are in your space or your competitors there's so much inspiration that you can take from from other places as well so that that's number one uh this the second thing to leveling up your game is to remember to be human we talked about it a lot mm. but uh remember to be human and uh not just rely on that kind of like that corporate brand but also be human and lift up the brand of some of your people mm. there's always a lot of times at least somebody in the company it might be the ceo and the founder for us uh it's it's devin reed our head of content strategy who used to be a salesperson himself that we lift up really really tremendously uh we've done a ton of things for other personas within the company uh, but also like lift up those people they are humans at the end of the day and they can be human and be the human face of, of what is typically kind of like a corporate brand. And so uh, I would also recommend that as well. I think that leads in nicely to the kind of employee branding side. And what I've seen, I think when you said beat a dog, that, that kind of triggered something. <laughs> and I, I think about your posts where you, you've you got the, you've got your employees online with their dogs. I think that was one of the posts you did and stuff. Yeah, that's um, right. I kind of, how important do you think it is in the, in the, and again, another word you used here is, is authentic. And that's definitely that's something that comes across because you use the people that are working there, whatever team or uh, they're in, and they may not necessarily be part of branding or marketing, but they're, they're still visible and active. Do you think that that plays an important part? Because the, I, I felt, well, particularly a year and a half ago when I started following you guys, that was something I really that resonated with me, the, the authentic and someone from finance or someone from CS, mm. they, they were they were kind of present, whether they were their dog or whether it was <laughs> climbing a mountain next to the lake. Um, so that's what, I think that'd be interesting. Maybe what, you, what are your thoughts on whether that could be leveraged, uh, particularly for the kind of earlier, smaller companies? Yeah, absolutely. 1000%. Uh, 1000%. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, Brian, I, I lead a onboarding session at Gong. So I have the good fortune of being able to chat with every one of the 650 or so now Gongsters that come through the doors, uh, virtual doors, uh, in air quotes. <laughs> um, but I open up that presentation with a question. And oftentimes the presentation is supposed to be about kind of like, what does the revenue marketing function do? Mm -hmm. And like, who are we and that kind of stuff. But I open it up with one question because everyone wants to know who, who is on the team and what does everybody do? And the question is who's in the marketing team? And a lot of times they shout out the people that they know on social media. It's like, oh, Udi, our CMO, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe for some crazy reason they've heard of me or maybe they <laughs> they know Devin Reed who's kind of one of the faces of our brand uh, but the answer to that question is everybody is in marketing mm. everybody is in marketing everybody's a part of the brand team everybody is a part of the marketing team and that's because we believe so so much in the power of lifting up kind of like those individual brands and making sure that they are successful, that, that that people on our team are bought in because it's the faces that people fall in love with, you know? It's it's the faces that people want to interact with. Uh, and those are the people mm. kind of like behind the brand. Uh, and it's super important because not only do humans love it, but actually the algorithm loves it too. Mm. Like on, on LinkedIn, it will almost always favor people over company company pages. Mm -hmm. And we found that along the way. You could post the same thing on your company page and then the same thing on some on a human person's page 
And if those two followerships are equal and the engagement is equal, this one is going to win. The human side is going to win uh, in terms of kind of like viewership and getting things out there because honestly, the algorithm favors human beings. Mm. Uh, it's a human network at the end of the day. And uh, Russell, I think uh, I couldn't have said it better because I, I think that's exactly what we also believe and, and you know, us with, with, with uh, Frontify. But in the end, I think you, you mentioned um, lifting people up. And I think one component is definitely that they, they, that they truly live and breathe the brand. And, and, but what, what else do you do? What else do you do, for example, for Sarah and Devin that you mentioned? Uh, you know, how do you enable them to, to be on brand on, 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 on the channels and, and to be kind of, you know, the gongster that you want them to be, if I can put it that way? Yeah, for sure. I think you have to be very deliberate about the people that you do lift up mm -hmm. to make sure that they're great embodiments of your culture and your brand. And we've done that as well, but also like be willing to make the investment to lift them up. Actually, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, Devin came to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Hey, Russell, uh, in order to like improve the quality of my posts on social media and the webinars and the videos that I do, I need to buy a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment in order to make sure that it looks fantastic and it looks professional mm -hmm. and it's a good representation of our brand. And a lot of times that request will go to like IT or like that request mm -hmm. will go to somebody that's like, why would I buy you $3,000 worth of camera equipment and, and sound like sound systems? Uh, but we were like, heck yes, we should do this. That sounds mm -hmm. like a tiny investment for what the impact can, can actually be. Uh, Or when, when I think about Sarah Brazier, who's now an awesome account executive for Gong, but she used to be an SDR for us. Uh, we brought in a video team every single week to film an episode of her series that we created on YouTube called Life as an SDR. Uh, and so we actually paid a pretty serious amount of money in order to get that <laughs> video team in and get the editing stuff done uh, to have somebody tell their story Uh, with with other with other people with guests on the show, and again, it's another one of those things that's like brands typically will shy away from that. It's like, okay, why would I have this person like tell their story? It's not the uh, that's not the product narrative that I'm trying mm. to drive towards. That's not the uh, that's not the latest webinar about mm. our about you know uh, that has uh, Forrester and Gartner that I'm trying to drive mm. towards. Uh, a lot of times people shy away from it, but it's like, that's the kind of thing that people fall in love with. because because again, people buy from people. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, quickly spoke, I think a couple of days now uh, ago and, and, you know, you're responsible for way more than we are just covered here now in this podcast at, at Gong. And I think like two things that really, uh, kind of, you know, stuck to my mind was events and also like, like the entire ABM program, but. I remember it was like five areas or six areas even, but um, maybe we can do a, a little bit of a deep dive there as well on like, how do you see, you know, again, like brand influencing these programs and the importance of brands in events, in ABM, in, in all the other areas where you're responsible for. Yeah. We bring the brand to life in all these other experiences. And so when I think about our events program, for example, When you come to a Gong event, it sure as heck better be as fun and as human <laughs> and as challenging as what you experience on social media and our brand, right? Those things need to be kind of like in sync, right? Mm. And I think about our last, uh, one of our last in-person conferences, gosh, which was now ages ago uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we had things like a drum, like a, like a drum line, bring people in from lunch. Mm. Uh, we had Bruno, our bulldog mascot there to take photos with people, uh, sitting in a throne. Um, we had, gosh, we had smoke, we had mirrors and we had the punchy, the punchy lines as well that were delivered in person as opposed to the couple of lines of text that you read on social media. And so, yeah, when, when I think about the events program, for example, it's how we bring the brand to life. And it's actually, uh, 
it, it's it's fantastic because it allows for the different mediums to resonate with different people. Some people love experiencing our brand on social. Some people love experiencing our brand uh, at our events. Some people love experiencing our brand by receiving a package, a direct mail campaign that they receive at their house or at their office. And so people resonate with different channels, but making sure that the brand is kind of like the fuel behind all of that is super important. Yeah. And then basically, you know, we talked about personal branding and we talked also about, you know, kind of authenticity. And there is also like, I, I would say one, but at the same time, two Russells as well. I mean, we, we researched you before this podcast and, you know, it's kind of, you know, we saw this very uh, brilliant, sharp uh, marketing director, but we also found something else about you. And, and I think, you know, uh, hip hop dancing, as, as kind of uh, Brian mentioned in the intro, we, we, we quickly talked about your passion about sports, etc. So uh, there is like this digital footprint of you that it's just like Russell. And, and how do you balance that? How do you see that? How more, um, I would say, you know, kind of authentic does this make you that you have both sides, basically, your professional life, but also your private life really accessible to everyone? How do you see that? Yeah, I, I, I try to do that uh, to really exude kind of like the authenticity that you're describing. Uh, everyone isn't just who they are at work, right? Mm. We bring our entire selves to work every single day and our social footprint should match that. Uh, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that you have a passion in whatever. For me, for example, it's, it's hip hop dance and I've been doing that for the last 15 years, kind of like traveling and competing and performing. Um, but for another person, it may be their love for avocado toast. It may be their <laughs> love for their dog. Uh, and sometimes people kind of like shy away from like, oh, if it's not about what I do in particular. So for me, if it's not about what I do in marketing, then maybe I shouldn't post it at all. Uh, or maybe I should make those things private or something like that. Um, but I think people respect having kind of like that authentic experience with you uh, because that's what people are craving. And they know that's what's real. They know that we're not always perfect all of the time, that we know that we're not always business all of the time. We're human beings and we're multifaceted. And so uh, you kind of have to balance those things if you want to be truly, truly authentic uh, in terms of kind of like your, your social and digital presence. Yeah, I love that. Uh, honestly, Russell, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I saw Brian next to me. I think it was really, really nice uh, that you spent the time with us today. I mean, in the end, we try to provide really valuable content to our audience. And I think, you know, uh, value. I personally love stuff that is kind of, you know, um, quick, sharp, to the point. I think you showed us all of that uh, today, basically. But uh, yeah, maybe as a service for, for our audience, what are what are the couple of takeaways that you want to give them uh, on their, I don't know, wherever they are uh, stuck in traffic or listening to the podcast in their vets. Like, what are the, the, the couple of things you want them to take away from today? Yeah, absolutely. And I know if I was the one listening to this, I would be the one who's like running outside or quickly making coffee or something like that <laughs> listening to this. So yes, totally agree. If I were to summarize our conversation, MJ, I think that the, there would be maybe five takeaways. One is, one is be human. Be human in your corporate brand, be human in a, and lift up the people within your team to expand your digital, your digital footprint. Uh, don't, the second one would be don't be afraid to do the little things. Mm. And we didn't touch on this that much, but I think it came across in a couple of spaces. But don't be afraid to respond back to people on social media. Don't be afraid to do things that will not scale. Honestly, like, for example, we found somebody post, uh, I think it was something about their, their dog passing away. And we immediately went to go make, uh, a sweater with their dog on it. And then we sent it to that person. Uh, but don't be afraid to do the little things that, that don't scale. Uh, the third thing would be, don't be afraid to challenge conventional wisdom. And this one we talked about a lot, but we talked about it with the Super Bowl and et cetera. Uh, but don't be afraid to be different to pull inspiration from B2C type brands. For example, if you're in B2B, don't be afraid to uh, just do the things that people tell you is not normal and, and you shouldn't do. And you, you Actually, if they tell you you shouldn't do it, you should probably actually run in that direction. <laughs> 
This is... Run in the direction where they tell you don't go. <laughs> the rebel inside everyone. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, it's a thing that everybody wants to do but never ends up doing. Uh, the, the fourth thing is to, to win as a team. Uh, it's not just about the social team or not even just about that one kind of like social media manager, but winning as a team means tackling social in the digital footprint as an entire marketing organization or branding organization, but also a broader company, right? Everybody at the end of the day should feel like they are in marketing. They are yeah. creating touch points along the brand journey. Every single one of us, whether you're at a pub talking to somebody, whether you are at an airport on a plane that all fuels the brand experience that, that people have with you. So, uh, when as a team, because because branding is not just kind of the, the marketing team or the branding team. And then the last one is to diversify your assets. And, and what I mean by that is use different forms of posts on social media, use different profiles, like individuals on your team that, that you want to lift up, like we've talked about. Uh, don't put all your eggs in kind of like one corporate profile basket into one kind of asset type that you do exceptionally well. Things resonate with different kinds of people. And so mm -hmm. making sure that you 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 realize that and you diversify uh, your portfolio of, of that social footprint is super, super important. So yeah, those are the five takeaways. Be human, be human, do the little things. Don't be afraid to challenge conventional wisdom, win as a team and diversify your assets. Uh, I think that's it, but I want to thank you both again. Uh, I think in order to stay sharp, you have to listen to podcasts like this. Mm -hmm. In order to stay sharp, you have to have conversations like this. So thank you for the engaging conversation. And I'm so looking forward to hearing the feedback from everybody listening to this thing. Uh, if you have any feedback at all, please do connect with me. Please do connect with Gong. Uh, I would love to hear any of that feedback. Yeah, and absolutely likewise. Thanks so much for your insightful words today. Uh, I hope it's not the last conversation. And you know, like a couple of years down the the road, we we can catch up. We can see what's new, uh, what does like uh, Gong has uh, reinvented the, the the social game again, and 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 where you ended up with. Uh, so thanks so much, Russell, for for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to our audience for listening to this podcast. And uh, yeah, speak soon. Thanks, MJ. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. If you like this episode, make sure you hit subscribe uh, in your favorite podcast app or go to frontify.com slash podcast uh, to hear more of this exciting content.